Welcome to this week's Concurrency Tech Series. We're going to be talking about digital lines of business, creating opportunities to be able to disrupt your industry. We have great guests and we have some great stories to share with you this week, as well as some deep dive into how you get started. Little introductions. My name is Nathan Lesnowski. I'm your host. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Concurrency and I'll be helping kick us off. We also have some returning guests from previous, uh, previous webinars. We have Brian Hayden. Brian is a managing architect with Concurrency. Lots of experience in this space. Going to tell some great stories about some customers that have disrupted their industry. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, really excited about this one today. I, I, I'm very passionate about this topic. Awesome. And then we also have Lewin. Lewin is principal architect with Concurrency. He is always involved in the nuts and bolts of digital enabling products, and he's going to share some interesting stories as well. Welcome, Lewin. Hey, thank you for having me again. This is going to be fun. Uh, we have a lot of uh, you know good uh, stories to tell, and this is a uh, area of growth, right? That everybody should be looking into. Amen to that. Thank you, Lewin. All right. So, what are we going to be covering? We're going to be talking about digital lines of business, taking your existing services that you bring to your customers and enabling them through a digital means, whether it's a purchasing vehicle or it's a product itself, to enable you to be able to sell in a new way and enable in a new way. We'll be sharing direct customer examples, what they have done to be able to bring digital lines of business to the customer, to their customers. And also we'll be talking about the types of products that they use, whether it's web or connected products or data. And we'll be talking about the thought process that you use to be able to get into this, how you start thinking about it, how you start engaging it, and of course, we have a whole slew of new events coming up. These are some really interesting ones. Our first one on March 11th is gonna be a Microsoft Ignite 2021 briefing. Microsoft Ignite is next week. If it is not on your calendar, it should be. Following up on Microsoft Ignite, we're gonna give you a best of, the best top 10 things that are coming out of Ignite. After that, we're gonna do an event on ransomware and zero trust security in particular, we're going to do a, some live hacking to show the difference between how a legacy environment responds and how your environment responds. We'll be talking on April 8th, 8th about employee productivity, particularly talking about Microsoft Viva. And finally, on April 22nd, we'll be talking about maximizing dynamics investment with Power Platform. So many interesting topics, and we're looking forward to you being part of it. Let's get started on digital lines of business. All right. So when we think about 2021, we're seeing two major areas of transformation happening. There's the transformation happening in IT operations, all the things you know about that your CIO is concerned with, cloud transformation, secure modern workplace. What we're talking about today is marketplace disruption. This is where we're driving new revenue or operational savings, and we're driving business outcomes directly for the business to engage its customers. This directly aligns to a North Star that we're thinking about, and I know you're thinking about, which is, how can our business benefit from digital lines of business? As we've moved through the pandemic, as we've moved out of the pandemic, we're starting to understand how digital lines of business has changed permanently the way we engage with businesses. And we're gonna be talking about this today and how you can be a leader in your organizational space as you think about your, your go-to-market and the fabric of how you deliver for your customers. I want you to think about how you can be the disruptor. In the digital era, we're in a position where the, the organization that engages its customers with a new vehicle of bringing their product to them is going to win. The one that brings it to them, meeting them where they're at, but bringing them to a new place and having them understand that this is where they wanted to be all along. And this is thinking about this in the context of value creation versus value destruction. The existing businesses, just think about it within the context of the pandemic. The ones that were right at the bottom of this maturity curve, what they were doing is they're receding in their perceived value with a customer. They're receding in their ability to engage a customer in a way that met them where they're at. Think about the ability for you to just simply have food delivered to your house. So many individuals took advantage of that transformation that they, they ordered it from their phone, it showed up at their house, they never went to a grocery store again. Now that became a normal way of them receiving groceries. Think about it, however, in terms of how that became an opportunity for value creation for them. How that then replaced something that they were already doing, but then became a value add for them to sell new products and services, and maybe even products and services that are attached to ongoing capabilities. 
such as maybe I'm delivering something that's an ongoing service versus something I'm just ordering once. Think about the transformation that happens, say, from a black from a from a movie theater going to to in-person movies to streaming. Disney Plus killed that, right? They created a great content that people wanted, and they enabled, they switched their value delivery mechanism directly to episode-based consumption of content. That move toward digital transformation of their service enabled them to be able to ride out the pandemic and then come out from it stronger than they were before. What we're talking about in this session is about delivering on new horizons of growth. Horizon one is really about enabling what you're doing now, enabling what you're doing now in a better way, improving it iteratively over your current business model. Horizon two is about thinking about how I can slightly differentiate my offering. How can I say, give them a new way of ordering? Maybe I go to a Starbucks and now I have gotten used to the idea of ordering from my phone rather than ordering from uh, from the person when I get there. And I simply show up at the Starbucks, I have a great experience, but I'm sort of quarantined with them. I'm trying to have a low touch experience. I get my coffee and I leave. So I've enabled a new engagement experience, but not one necessarily that's completely different from the way I'd engaged before. And then think about a Horizon 3 scenario where you're bringing a completely new business model to the table. Maybe I'm delivering a service that isn't based on what I had delivered before. It's based on something new. It's a new profitable engagement down the road. And this is where we have the opportunity to explore with the digital transformation that we're enabling for our customers. This is where business models shift from maybe uh, buying a car that, that I might have a new, new model where I'm, I'm driving it to, do I even own a car? How, I just wanna get to where I wanna go. And maybe I just order that, that, that car on my phone, it shows up on my house. Maybe there's not even a driver in it and it drives me to where I need to be. So what we're gonna be talking about today is a relationship between delighting our customers and satisfying our customers. And sometimes we have to find a spot right between those two places. We're meeting them where they're at, we're meeting the point of parity they need to be, and maybe a new point of parity as we move through the pandemic, and we're going to a point where they find new points of differentiation that we then create a new normal for them. This is really where disruption happens, where we take something that they expect, we replace it with something that they didn't expect but they now know they need, and we're building on that to create new capabilities. We're talking about meeting them with a job they need to be done, something that they know they want, like hunger. Think about a milk, milkshake for breakfast. We wouldn't necessarily think about that initially, but if I'm satisfying the hunger, for example, in our family, we oftentimes have shakes for breakfast, or we have a, uh, a blended kind of blended some fruit and, and uh, other kinds of things for breakfast. I would have never thought about doing that until we started doing it. It became normal. It became something that satisfied our hunger in a different way, in a more complete way, in a way that uh, we wouldn't want to go without at this point. But it took someone offering that new service to us or to them to allow us to see that's something that really satisfied us. It's something that we now want to hire for that job of satisfying our hunger. One of the things we'll talk about today is, is the ideas around modularity theory, the idea that I can create new systems of systems. I can create the bedrock on which things run by offering it to my customer through a vehicle that they accept, such as I, I build this, the vehicle for me to be able to have a connected boat platform or a connected car platform. Well, I might not be buying directly the connected the connected boat or the connected car might be just buying an experience of having an off-boat experience or an on-boat experience. Modularity theory is all about understanding that when we create a connected system of systems, I then own the ability to have replaceability within that and innovation on top of that platform. We're going to be talking about how disruptive innovation is powered by enabling technology. It's powered by something new that replaces something old that drives wide population acceptance, that's driven by an innovative business model, maybe a business model that is not that is different than what I may have consumed or bought before. So, uh, think about some of the business models that are, uh, that are uh, about consuming a set amount of something over a given, a given period, like, uh, like I have meat delivered to my house every month, right? I get a box, it contains meat. That meat is maybe what I was expecting or maybe what I wasn't expecting that month, but it's what I needed and it's delivered on an ongoing basis. It's good for the provider, it's good for me, and it's not a business model I had been accustomed to prior. And then also a coherent value network, something that aligns my suppliers and partners and distributors with what the customers want and 
also can provide a differentiation in the way they think about the value network. Why do I buy uh, meat that's delivered to me on an ongoing basis? Well, because I've come to trust in the product that's being delivered to me, and I have trust that's in that value network. I believe in the suppliers that are local that are being delivered from it. Maybe I believe in the way it's produced. There's things about the value network that I understand and trust. So these create a united front in the way that we deliver this disruption to our customers and enable us to be able to represent something that's differentiated in their mind, but also differentiated in the reality of how I deliver it to them. So think about this finally in, in the context of a maturity curve. It's our ability to move up from legacy products that we build that are understood in the context of a legacy business to building customer platforms that meet the customer where they are. That's kind of where I think about maybe Starbucks thinking about their selling model where they, uh, you know, they, they're selling coffee from their stores. Now I can buy from my mobile, my mobile phone. That's, a, that's meeting my customer where they're at. It's enabling them to be able to purchase in a low touch experience. But then maybe on top of that, I'm monetizing. I'm selling them new services where they may not have been before. I'm driving them to particular stores because they have lower lines. But then on top of that, I start to think about how do I disrupt that market? How do I bring a unique experience, not necessarily just to buying coffee, but maybe the way that they serve their customers? Think about their brand even bigger than selling coffee. And you start thinking about what their next step is. That's where industry changing fits in. That's where disruptive innovation sits in. This idea around driving something new that they think about and turns the industry on its head. And that's where many of these customers that we're gonna talk about have, have transformed how they serve their customers, not just in their Horizon 1 initiative, but in their Horizon 2 and 3. And this is through a variety of vehicles, whether it's voice and augmented reality, web and mobile experiences, or it's APIs into B2B selling channels. So let's drive into our first scenario. And this is talking about Brunswick. Brunswick is a customer that is the leader in digital boating. They are doing some really fantastic things. I love, I'd love for our team to talk a little bit about what we have experienced with Brunswick's transformation of their market. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. So Nathan, thanks for that introduction. Uh, you know, when you think about Brunswick um, as a brand, they touch their customers in so many different ways through their different brands. And where we're gonna kind of start talking is really around the motors, uh, their, their Mercury Marine um, division. And, you know, at one point in time, they, they decided they're gonna put a uh, IoT device inside of these motors so they can start collecting information. And, you know, that's the first step. Can't really do anything until you start collecting it. But, you know, taking a, a disruption, um, you know, type of idea. And I, I love that slide that you had before where it was think big, think big and value creation. Like, what are we going to do here for this, for these customers? It's a motor. So how big can you really think about this? Well, the innovation here is really kind of, in, you know, ingenious. Uh, like I said, they've got many different brands, whether it's, you know, a boat that you buy from Brunswick or the motor that you buy from it. But in the motor, com you know, capacity, how do you really connect an individual to something that's just so operational, something you don't even really think about that sits on the back end of your boat or maybe, you know, wherever. So for them, you know, collecting this IoT information allows them to reach their customers, you know, in the same way that when you're driving your car, you get an, a check engine oil, you know, you check your engine oil or your filter needs to be replaced. And it gives you kind of a peace of mind. So here they're able to take off brands, boats that they don't own, um, and get themselves a personal experience in order to start to uh, reach their customers and have um, you know, somewhat of a direct uh, relationship with them where they, they aren't driving something that would be considered a brand of theirs. Um, I, we could talk a little bit about the IoT stuff, you know, in terms of the technology that was used and Lewin uh, had some pretty uh, direct involvement there. Yeah, so in this particular case, right, with, with Brunswick and their boating platform, we're looking at not just creating a single, you know, platform for a one-type use, because as, as, as you can tell, right, that we're looking at a uh, you know, cross-platform touching multiple different services that they provide, right? We can look at an engine as one platform. It could be looking at, you know, potentially other areas as well, right? You know, ballast, uh, you know, uh, pumps, so on and so forth. So what we did and what uh, is that we actually created a solution that is a foundation-based solution based on Microsoft, in this case, Microsoft IoT Hub and the uh, IoT solution as a baseline. And then we built on top of these, right? 
in each of these divisions, because we have a baseline, replication of this process becomes a lot easier. And everybody has the same base and the same exact uh, you know, system to grow from and learn from each other as well. So even within uh, the organization, right, you can actually have a growth factor that is multiplying at, at a different rate, you know, because R&D is being done across multiple different areas without, you know, having a particular one division, you know, that's just doing excelling in one area at this point. Uh, we can actually start, uh, you know, getting information across from various teams. And in this case, right, we're looking at not just the reason why making a particular thing smarter, right? At the end of the day, people, the consumers are buying this thing for the capabilities, right? We are actually helping, helping Brunswick and all of their divisions within Brunswick and various different platforms, get, you know, as, uh, accelerate to, that, to these various capabilities uh, using, uh, you know, platforms and the know-how that we have uh, in our back, you know, pockets, right? And, and, and accelerate the customers. Right, yeah, and in this scenario, you're talking about enabling a new value stream for people to have an on-boat experience and an off-boat experience that provides awareness of what's going on around them when they're on the boat yep. and the safety and the the awareness of the status of their boat before they put it in the water. Like people have had that experience with their boat. Like I've got all the kids with their life preservers on, their swimsuits on, they're all in the boat. We kind of got on tide and it's floating away and the engine won't start, right? And yeah. they, that's like the worst experience. Turn the best thing about your day into the worst thing about your day. But this sure. is a great opportunity for them to like augment that, right? And create a great customer experience attached to the boat. Yeah, you are essentially selling a you know, peace of mind to a customer, right? And and there is, you know, uh, th there is no easy value to put around that. But however, this the value is the customer is now attached to your product line and they will come back to you for other things, right? Now you are a trusted uh, source for the customer and they will actually come back and they will say, hey, anything that these guys do, right? They have thought through that for me. And I can actually, you know, I can trust that, you know, in this case, right? Uh, my boat's gonna start every time if I don't listen to this app, right? I can actually tell ahead of time when I need to change my oil or when my battery is gonna be low, et cetera, before you even get in there. I mean, you know, that would be awesome, right? If I can do that for my car as well and any other things. So it's not, it's not just one area, we can actually do it across multiple areas. Absolutely. Yeah, and I love how uh, with the Nauticon platform, they've really established a customer relationship with, you know, a, with a non-traditional customer, and now they can reach them from other marketing channels and bring them into, you know, other platforms. All right, let's move on to another example. This is the work that's happening with uh, Performance Food Group and Reinhardt surrounding their digital product offering. Lewin, you want to talk a little bit about this? Sure. Um... In this particular case, right, Reinhardt and uh, Performing uh, Food Groups, these are the uh, people who actually, you know, uh, deliver food uh, and, and products to restaurants, right? In this case, you know, uh, a restaurant or a chain of restaurants could be ordering uh, food from them. That's where you actually essentially get your get your products uh, from, right? When you go to, you know, uh, whether if you go to a chain restaurant or if you go to a one-off, you know, uh, Michelin star restaurant, typically they will come from somewhere. <laughs> They don't usually grow their own food up on the roof, right? Uh, so they have the order from from these guys, and um, and in this particular case, we actually help uh, create two different uh, uh, applications. The first one on the left that you see is actually a mobile application that is made and targeted towards the chefs and the people in the restaurant. So traditional method of uh, delivery, right? Traditional method that these uh, people are normally ordering from Reinhardt, uh, you know, and, and people like uh, Reinhardt is that, you know, uh, every morning, uh, you know, or every so so many days, right, on a schedule, a uh, chef or a sous chef or, you know, whoever who's been filling the pantry will go into various different shelves in pantry, check off a list and write down what's needed. Same thing happens in the fridge, you know, et cetera. And then they will pick up the phone and order or they will go on a website and, you know, punch the orders in. What we help create is a mobile app. What happens is we, um, in this case, right, Reinhardt and their sales crew went over to the restaurants, give them, give these people an app, right, uh, that allows them to actually use a phone to walk into a pantry, eliminating the paper process altogether, and add these items in at the same time. What we can, what we did on top of that is that as items are getting checked off, we can actually show them similar items 
or other things that they might be interested in, right? Well, now we can actually show them a different way to, I would call it upsell, but not just, you know, give them a different ideas on things that they can actually, you know, expand their menu systems, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, if, if items are not available, right, substitute things out as well at will without actually, you know, alienating these, these, these end users, right? Additionally, with a technology like this, right, we actually also enable for offline mode. So let's say if somebody's walking with a fridge in the middle of a giant, you know, fridge, there is no, you know, uh, signal, right? We actually enable the offline mode, et cetera. So when they come back in, as soon as you press send, these clients right away knows whether if they're going to get the order the way they want it. You know, if there is a, you know, item that is on back order, right, they would know it right away rather than waiting for an email to come back in at 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. whenever they process it. It happens instantaneously. So the session goes up, we know exactly what's going to be on the menu and they can plan, right? Restaurants can plan the menu ahead of time. The, on, the, on the right side, it's an application for salespeople, right? If you are actually, a, uh, you know, in this case, a person that is, you know, uh, in charge of maybe owning a group of chain restaurants or an area in, in a particular sales, right? As soon as somebody logs into their system, they can actually look at their to-do list, right? Every, you know, as soon as I walk in, I was like, hey, at 3 p.m., I would call this person. These are the phone numbers. It's uh, your daily task items are listed right, right away. If there are any emergencies happening, if there is a particular item that, you know, couldn't be made available, they will know right away so they can call and make sure the customer satisfaction goes sky high, right? If you can reach the customer ahead of time and give them, a, you know, either good news or bad news. So we are enabling that kind of features. And on top of it, right, data entry was important to these guys. And we actually made it so that we can, instead of entering these data, you know, and getting to a website or what, whatever you are, we can do that offline uh, from a car or from a you know, hotel room or from, from your own you know, home and enter these data in quickly using, you know, uh, literally uh, one finger essentially, right? Tab and enter, tab and enter. And, uh, and and submit these orders and for these uh, these restaurants as well. We are increasing in these two cases, right? Scalability and the efficiency of everyone using it. Plus, you know, giving them the satisfaction of getting the data right away and results right away as well. Awesome, thank you, Lewin. All right, let's talk about Burgess and Nipal. They are doing visual inspection. This is a really yes. interesting visual inspection scenario. Yeah. Uh, in this particular case, right, uh, before I get to Burgess and Nipo, we, you know, I want to actually go over a bit of other items that we look at, right? This is mm. the area of what I would call a data, uh, uh, you know, ingestion. Data ingestion could come from various different sources, right? We have worked with IoT devices that are steel mills, you know, you know, super hot, high heated steel to, you know, live data coming from, you know, a childbirth, right? All of these are data that we have looked at and we actually learn from you know, using our uh, modern, you know, apps, data and AI team, right? We have a data scientist, uh, actually a number of data scientists on board that can help decipher these things. And we actually look at those ahead of time. So we actually can tell you, uh, you know, some of these scenarios that, that, that are taking place. That takes us to budget, budgets itself, right? In this particular case, they have a unique scenario. In, the, in their scenario, we're looking at a data that is coming on a non-traditional method. By, by that, uh, what I mean is it's not a, you know, a data coming from a signal from a, like an IoT device, you know, that tells you a temperature of a sensor or uh, humidity, right? We're looking at things like a picture that is coming in and telling me what does that picture actually truly mean? In this case, we are looking at a scenario of uh, inspection, right? In this particular uh, uh, item, we looked at a sewer tunnel inspection. We actually put a robot down a sewer tunnel and actually say, hey, Tell me exactly what's wrong with these tunnels, right? What, how, what, are there any uh, areas that we should be concerned about? Because these guys actually report back to DOT, and you know, uh, it's, it's a it's a federal you know uh, mandated uh, uh, inspection results that they got to give back, right? There are certain rules and certain type of items that we got to look at. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, you know, people who are professional engineers, right, who actually have a title of professional engineers will do inspections of these natures and they take a lot of time and practice and uh, a lot of uh, training to get this level of you know uh, recognition of these various defects uh, we actually help using you know a number of defects that they have detected in the past right we did a custom model for these guys and we train them uh with you know starting with uh two different type of uh, uh cracks 
and from the results set is that even from a grainy image like this right because obviously some of the newer cameras are better some are not as good we can tell you exactly how severe a crack is and what type of you know uh, crack uh, a particular uh, item is happening from looking at pictures so we take pictures and we actually send a video feed and and, and decipher it the best part is this normally a pe would literally look at a video right let's see if it's hour long they have to sit through hour maybe they can fast forward maybe half of that and you know and, and and you know when you fast forwarding items right you might skip a few crack here and there in this particular case because we're doing frame by frame through all the sequence of a video right a recording to an ai model i can actually get a, an hour long video in about literally about less than five minutes right look at the productivity goes up and i can give you indexing points of where these particular cracks are and it gets better right at the end of the day it improves you know these particular clients expectations and because they are now the uh, foreground you know particular uh, forefront in this particular knowledge area they can turn around and they can use this algorithm and they can actually tell it to other people and you know have it run through them and make money on top of it right so it's, it's new business growth as well as a continual growth area inside of the internal and external business yeah you know the most interesting thing about this is at first glance i would have no idea what i'm looking at in that picture but yeah. You know the fact that we can train a machine to be able to analyze input and then optimize the time that the professional engineer is is actually looking at problems to where there actually are problems as opposed to having to just look through lots and lots and lots of video content it's just amazingly impactful so much that we can do from that yeah and it, it, it doesn't right. end there right it goes to other places as well we can look at other areas we can inspect many many things beyond just these type of cracks go ahead all point. right, so let's get to our uh, our, our last uh, example here, which is Duffin Phelps. Duffin Phelps is doing so many interesting things, but they have a particularly interesting story that is really uh, a good example of the digital transformation of something that you wouldn't have thought about. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, this is great. Um, we, we should have had a 40-minute webinar today because uh, <laughs> exactly. we're all talking about this stuff, and there's so much. I mean, there's really so many cool stories to tell. So. Duff and Phelps has a uh, is is known as the world's largest valuation company. In one of their lines of business, they publish these books, uh, really thick books, which are basically in Excel, you know, a printed version of Excel, where uh, analysts will look up values, you know, and, and make some calculations. So for them, you know, how do I? Why would I want to digitize this first, and how do I digitize it? Uh, you know, was kind of a problem. But they took that book and they they turned it into a digital product by having that data available, but also giving them a means and a reason to use it to create the valuations that uh, the cost of capital valuations that that their customers were looking at. So what we're looking at at the top right uh, is somewhat of a, that's a version of the product that's out there right now, where you know we've we've utilized that data. Uh, collected a couple pieces of information and, and been able to give that information to the consumers without them having to tab through through a book. The value proposition for the customer is an easy easy to use interface, but for Duff and Phelps it meant a lot more. So they had all these printed books and they would sell them. They're, they're expensive books, you know, seven eight hundred dollar books or whatever, and their customers, you know, would share those within the office. Well, now by going to a subscription based model where they can sell licenses, seat licenses, they can collect revenue from everybody that's actually utilizing it. And so they found that they have actually increased their revenue. Uh, you know, by by going into a subscription model. The other thing that I wanted to to illustrate here, as well with the the Duff and Phelps, or with the cost of capital uh, application, is that you know they they also recognize that some of their users are more power users. So not only just having a web interface like you see in the top right, but below that you see that that there's a custom Excel plugin that allows uh, you know people that are a little bit more data focused to be able to to access the data uh, in a in an environment that they're comfortable with. So then, you know, taking it to the next level, and we talked about the subscriptions, uh, if you forward just a little bit uh, to the next slide, um, you know, we've got that application, you know, we have some innovative ways to use it. You know, you um, in the background, you can see that there's, um, 
that, that we're building out a subscription model so we can actually segment how much data they have access to, you know, and have them pay a premium for the stuff that we think that is going to provide more value. And then more importantly, uh, with Duff and Phelps, one of the big parts of this project was to create a branded experience. So down at the bottom, you see a couple of different login uh, experiences. And uh, incidentally, uh, Duff and Phelps has been rebranded to Crawl. Uh, that sort of was launched in the last 24 hours. So uh, you, you do see uh, the, the Crawl experience. But by using the... By using Microsoft's different identity frameworks, you have B2B, you have B2C, you have managed identities, you can go straight at AAD with federated uh, you know, identity providers. With B2C, which is a, a platform that we really help them out with, you can get a true customized experience like that crawl login down below versus you know, the, the other login experience where, it, uh, where it's more of a bland, you know, just an out of the box type of, of unbranded experience. So really there's a lot of different ways that you can capture uh, you know, consumer, consumers and give them a, a, rich, um, a rich experience. And I know we're, we're running up against the time, so good talk about this all day. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, Brian. What a great example of taking something which really was physical, like a physical delivery model for information and not just saying, okay, you know what, I'm gonna digitize that as a PDF and send it to you. This is about taking that idea, shifting the idea to what they really needed and, and building upon it. Yeah, a brand new platform. Awesome. Well, we would love to follow on with this by being your trusted co-development and coaching partner. We see ourselves as helping drive the innovation mindset within your teams by driving product thinking, by doing so with a understanding of your customer and being data-driven, by partnering with you in pods to be able to drive this kind of innovation that you're seeing, whether it's constructing new web-based applications, IoT, AI, or just thinking about what the idea needs to be, we can bring that capability to the table. And we love to drive that into a next step with you around our IP solutions, around thinking about how you can disrupt your market, being the leader rather than the follower. So as a next step, we would love to meet virtually one-on-one -on -one to talk about how we can bring some of these same kinds of capabilities that you saw throughout these four examples and the thought process attached to disruptive innovation to your organization. And we also are looking forward to you coming to our upcoming events. We have some great events coming up. These events are gonna be just really interesting. The next ones, especially talking about what's coming out of Ignite, is gonna be chock full of new information about what Microsoft is bringing to the table with with uh, the Ignite briefing, and we'll drive into the following events from there. Also, of course, you can visit concurrency.com for blogs and videos and seeing these case studies live. And again, we would love to meet with you one-on-one -on -one to talk about how we can bring these kinds of disruptive capabilities to the table. So thank you for our presenters today, and also thank you for you for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you.